So the 2004 elections um, are a wonderful case study for uh, what happens in uh, uh, semi-presidential systems, <coughs> what can happen in semi-presidential systems, uh, where uh, the president has the powers of nomination, how that power and authority influences um, uh, the, uh, the formation of a government. So, so we are in 2004, and uh, while all the elections are still happening at the same time, uh, the presidential election has two rounds, uh, right? Uh, two ballots. Uh, it's two ballots. Uh, so the first two candidates from the first round go to the second round, unless one gets 50% or uh, more than 50% the first round, which doesn't really happen. Um, so, but the parliamentary elections happen together with the first round of the presidential election. Two weeks later, there is the second round of the presidential election, right? Uh, so the results of the parliamentary election from you know two weeks ago might uh, you know uh, would normally start the process of government uh, coalition uh, formation, right? Which, however, is influenced by this transition from the first round of the presidential election to the second round by the goings on and by the result of the second round. But let's see how it works. It's better to uh, take a look at it. So, 2004 elections, um, that is, um, in the parliament, so you see um, here a, a, a broad opposition. Truth and Justice uh, Alliance, well, it kind of tells you what it is about. It is about an anti PSD, anti social democrats, uh, oligarchs, uh, you know, sort of alliance. Uh, the, uh, the PSD is itself in a coalition with a tiny party, which one could ask why would they enter into a coalition with such a tiny party? Because the, it's the leader of that party who owned a large media company. So, in order to have access to private media. Um, uh, so, then. Uh, you have uh, the winner, the, the, the basic winner of the election is the, uh, not with the majority, of course, is the, uh, the it's PSD, right? Uh, it's the social, social Democrats, right? And they, you could suspect, might find some partners to form a coalition, I don't know with whom. But they could, right? Even a minority government, whatever. Uh, however, in the presidential election, You have the two main candidates are the candidate one the candidate of the PSD right Adrian Nastase who used to be just you know just ended his term as the prime minister remember he was this arrogant authoritarian mindset uh, you know uh, you know it's democracy but his mindset and corrupt and whatever uh, uh, guy and he was kind of seen to be coasting to victory in the first round uh, he gets forty percent versus thirty three percent of uh, to try and assess. Rand Vesescu, a name to be remembered. Um, not going to go into detail about him, but he's the candidate from the uh, from the anti-PSD uh, coalition, which is formed by the Democratic Party and by the National Liberals. Uh, and yet, in the second round, in the second round, Vesescu manages to defeat surprisingly, shockingly. Uh, and Nastase, and it, there was a famous TV debate between them in which Vesescu, uh, uh, well, he is a much more popular character than Nastase, kind of this colder personality, not, uh, you know, more, more coasting on the waves of authority, basically, on, on position, while Vesescu is much more gregarious, and he, he really used that well in the uh, debate, and there was this famous phrase that he uttered, uh, what did this country deserve? Uh, what did this country do? What did this country do to deserve us too? <laughs> to deserve two people who used to be part of the communist system, uh, and and now it's still us. Uh, what 20, 15 years after the, the revolution? Uh, that was a huge blow because it was it, it portrayed Vesescu as this honest, direct, straightforward guy, and Nastasia was completely blown away. Um, okay, so he wins the election, so now normally you would have cohabitation of some sort, right? You would have Trevor Besescu um, as president, right, clearly, with a, a PSD government of some sort. But here's, here's where the, the power of the, I made this point in that paper that I posted, um, here's where, where the power and authority of the presidential position is really illustrated. Because just by the weight of this position, and by the power that the president would have to, uh, you know, put some or not put obstacles in, 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 in front of policy making and whatever, it still is the most prestigious position in the, the system. 
he forces, he ekes out a, a, a coalition, a, a most incredible coalition, because, okay, you will have the Justice and Truth Alliance, Da, by the way, the acronym means yes in Romanian, just like in the Czech Republic member, ANO means uh, something uh, concerned citizens, but also meant yes, right? Um, so that is okay, that is the party that supports him, but he breaks up that tiny, that coalition uh, in which the social democrats were involved, and I'm going to say, well, it breaks it up, that was a tiny party, yes, but when you enter into a, uh, uh, into a sort of a electoral coalition, right, a coalition to run together on the same list, uh, parties agree to distribute how percentages of the seats obtained. So even if this party is a very tiny party, actually the party is a, of a guy, basically, of a, of a rich media owner, you know, because of this agreement with the social uh, uh, democrats, he was guaranteed a number of seats. And those three seats are snatched up, uh, so Vesescu uh, and the Justice and Truth Science snatches up this smaller partner of the Social Democrats and those seats, and also uses enters into coalition with the Democratic, uh, with the Hungarian Party, uh, Hungarian Union, basically association, Democratic Union, which is a coalition of Hungarian parties, by the way. Um, so, <coughs> so there you have it. Uh, the Hungarian Party can enter into coalition, of course, because they have, you know, skill in aligning with whoever in terms of getting their goals done. Um, <clears throat> so that's how they form a, a, a government. It was a huge coup. It was a huge coup because at, at the end of the first round, it looked like, again, the Social Democrats, again, this corrupt, it's just going to be just worse and worse. And this was a, this was a, a, a huge turnaround, a huge turnaround which, which gave tremendous uh, uh, popular uh, support to, uh, to Vesescu and his forces. Okay, so that's in 2004. It's a wonderful example of uh, presidentialism in action. Now, in order to discuss politics since 2004, um, let me just uh, propose and uh, uh, describe briefly the major issues, themes, or, and or cleavages in Romanian politics after 2004. Now, we discussed the ones that dominated politics until 2000. I mentioned in 2000, those cleavages go away, the eastward, westward, versus, uh, and the uh, pro against uh, ethnic minorities, uh, because of those developments that I have discussed. I'm not going to go back on that. Uh, and then uh, I would argue that after 2004, that new cleavages emerged, new issues emerged that will dominate uh, Romanian politics and, and give meaning to, to uh, all those, uh, uh, all the many fluctuations in. in in uh, Romanian politics, in the parties, in government, and so on. And these would be, uh, let's, uh, I, would, I would categorize them as um, the oligarch left, basically, the, 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 the PSD associated oligarch sort of, uh, well, it's not really center left, it's a vague name because they're not so ideologically clear, uh, but let's call it a, a, a center left, uh, you know, who you know, the, the characteristic of it is that it is less reformist, it is more uh, directed at, at um, keeping the, the, the reins of power of, 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 uh, and of getting the benefits of power. So it has a network, a countrywide network of local power holders, so-called barons, uh, which is a phenomenon in many other countries as well, local barons who are both economic and political elites. So that's what PSD stands for in many ways, in, in, for many people. Uh, <clears throat> and so that would be one, one sort of a side of this cleavage, and the other one would be the reformist. And the reform here would mean, you know, uh, 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 reforming this sort of a corrupt uh, system. So this takes, uh, so this oligarchs, you know, this, uh, this political economic elite versus Reformists would be one sort of a division. Um, then would be the corruption, anti-corruption. Uh, those in the political elite who, who uh, are more fiercely, or in the in the sphere, in the public sphere, who are fiercely for anti-corruption measures and fighting corruption, and those who are putting obstacles to this. Um, then uh, we could also talk about the cleavage between. Uh, 
uh, a sort of a new, newer cleavage between uh, a right wing, a center right that is very neoliberal economically, you know, free market, uh, shock therapy, and so on, uh, versus a more uh, stagnating, more reluctant to endeavor reforms, more interested in just keeping power um, uh, faction. So, neoliberal populist right versus a non anti reformist or, or, or slower reform, gradualist or whatever, um, uh, gradualist uh, uh, political forces, or not even gradualist, yeah, literally reluctant to endeavor reforms. Uh, more, you know, uh, uh, concerned with um, keeping the status quo and uh, ma maintaining political support by not endeavoring radical reforms. Um, this, this would be a third uh, kind of a cleavage um, that shaped politi politics in Romania. And then a fourth one would be uh, those who want to deal with the communist past and those who do not. Those who want to, what your book mentions uh, under the, the, the term, um, expression, transitional justice, those who want to, uh, uh, you know, use the tools of the state and of the uh, uh, institutional tools of the state to deal with the communist past. And this includes uh, opening the uh, secret, the files of the Securitate, which was the secret police, which happened, for example, in East Germany in 1990 one or two, never happened in Romania, right? So this sort of a cleaning up of the public sphere because all of those, you know, all of that, all of those immoral, all those criminal acts in many ways, right, through which the population was subjugated, was, was controlled, was, that they, they, it was never um, uh, that, uh, purged, that, that legacy has never been purged, that legacy has never been worked out, worked, uh, uh, transformed, okay? And you need to transform it through doing several things. And uh, some of the models are, you know, opening up these files as Israel did. And everybody can look up the, the files that the secret police have had on them, right? Uh, everything, all the informers, what they told about it. So to clarify that, that burden of history, uh, to, to eliminate the, those who have collaborated with the secret police from public life. This has always been a, a request of the opposition, so quote unquote, in the 90s, obviously. Those who were in power, the ex-communist Iliescu and the, his company, they did not want to do that. Uh, so this is also a delayed thing. And remember, we're talking 2006, uh, let's say, right? And 20, 15 years later, and it's still not done. I mean, again, delayed reform. Uh, so basically, uh, let's clarify, you know, uh, classify these cleavages, you know, anti-communist and uh, ex-communist. But again, it's not about the communists are basically gone, those who used to be, right? Um, uh, clearly those who used to be in the leading positions. There are those who have a shady past, especially because they have worked with the secret police before, maybe they have been informants, because many of them have been the winners of the transition, especially in the first 10 years, they were the ones who became the oligarchs, the rich people, right? For example, the leader of that party I mentioned, the small party, the media owner, he used to be a secret, sir, secret police informer. With the transition, he put his hands on some state assets that's how oligarchs were born. So, anyway, uh, this anti-communist sort of versus uh, we we'll call it ex-communist, although it might be just political elite that doesn't want to do that. Simply that that sort of a cleaning up, right? Uh, because, uh, well, for many reasons, uh, including for the fact that some of their allies might be taken down by such reforms. Um, so I mentioned so four four types of cleavages, right? Oligarchs versus reformists. Uh, corruption versus anti-corruption, uh, right-wing liberal, uh, economically neoliberal versus uh, uh, non-reformist, non-economic, uh, you know, those who don't want to do economic reforms, anti-communist versus, let's say, ex-communist or whatever you want to call it. What's interesting about these cleavages is that they don't fall neatly uh, along party lines, and that's the interesting thing. And in fact, within this period of, after 2004, gradually, they would concentrate on two poles, around two poles. And one pole would be represented by uh, the president, Basescu, who will actually stay in power, as you see, for two mandates. So that's 10 years now, because the mandate of the president has been expand extended to five years. Um, so Basescu and the parties that form around him, and, and the rest in many ways. It, and it's, in fact, this is the fifth cleavage. It's basically Basescu and his, in, and his uh, you know, uh, allies and the rest. 
And by this I'm not making myself into this sort of a superhero with an anti-corruption cape. Uh, he's a very abrasive, very powerful, very uh, popular, very gregarious personality, very controversial in many ways, and uh, he's very direct, uh, the way he expresses himself and so on, so many people dislike him just for that. Uh, but it is incontrovertible that he was uh, the spearhead for various reasons, he was many, often the spearhead of all these reformist moves, both neoliberal, both anti-communist, both uh, economically reformist, both uh, anti-corruption. So it's, it happened that this, this has, doesn't mean that all the others were completely against all of these aspects, but clearly they became sort of allied together against Basescu, so in many ways, politics after 2004 until today, this is one of the cleavages is Basescu and his uh, people and versus the rest. And, and let me mention a final cleavage which is also interesting, but it also points out to, the, to that democratic fatigue that I, I mentioned post-1989 democratic fatigue, that kind of or post-transition fatigue that I, uh, we identified in the other countries. And that would be a cleavage basically between the political uh, uh, elite uh, and the people, literally. Uh, this sort of disaffection with the status quo, the, the, which in this case you kind of see why in many ways, right? Um, uh, the disaffection with a political leader that is seen as not doing anything, as clinging to their benefits, which in many cases is true, uh, and yet getting re-elected because who else do you elect? And so, you know, participation in, vote, in voting goes down, many people emigrate, uh, also as a result of economic hardships and so on. So, that would be the, the other sort of a cleavage, the people versus the political elite, and which is also makes things interesting. interesting. Uh, I want to point, um, okay, so um, between 2004 and 2008, so Basescu does such, uh, such uh, endeavors, such moves, such moves against, uh, towards dealing with uh, the communist past, the transitional justice. And for example, in 2006, he uh, opens the, he, uh, his government, well, his, uh, under his presidency, uh, the, the, the files of the Securitate, of the former secret police, are opened and people become, get access, and there are many people from the political um, elite which fall, many heads rolled as a result of that, because many from different, from all the parties by the way, and all, the entire spectrum almost, uh, were discovered to have had collaborated with the former secret police. Uh, and obviously now you understand why they didn't want to open the, the files. Um, in 2007, he is also, um, um, or, uh, or thereabouts, he also officially condemns communism in the parliament and this was uh, a ridiculous uh, uh, parliamentary session in which the president went and condemned communism and literally large parts of the parliamentarians were booing him because they were, for example, from the Greater Romania party which come from that former secret police background. Uh, so it was, it was a scandalous, scandalous uh, meeting but here it is, the president of the state officially condemning communism as a criminal ideology, just like, you know, Nazism was condemned in, you know, Germany and, and so on. And that is an important, again, watershed moment. Uh, although, you see, with what, what divisions in the, in the political elite, right? That's, again, it's, it's an interesting thing that all this happens within the political elite. 2007, Romania enters the EU. Notice that it's later than the other, uh, the Central European countries, but we'll talk about that. Um, Finally, uh, uh, also, <laughs> between 2004 and 2008, divisions occur, of course, within the coalition of uh, um, the former anti-PSD coalition. You see this, you know, I mean, it was a very fragmented, very complicated coalition. Divisions occur, and um, uh, in 2007, uh, the liberals break from the Democrats, uh, Basescu is from, was from the Democrats, a part of the Liberals stay with the Democrats and form the, part, the Liberal Democratic Party, uh, and you have a minority government in 2007 made of the Liberals and the Hungarian Party. So you have a cohabitation situation in 2007, um, and uh, so at this point in 2007 you have the Liberals and the Hungarian Party in, in, in government against Basescu, because the division is between the, the other leaders and Basescu, basically. 
And so they're against Basescu. The Social Democrats are against Basescu. So you have a majority in Parliament against Basescu, so they, they try to impeach him, actually to suspend him. And so, it, again, this is, it's part of this, it's, a, it's an example of the fact how the semi-presidential system can lead to significant problems. 2007, in Romania, you have the parliament suspending the president. I mean, that never happened in France, that never happened in Poland, right? Um, so, but it is a possibility in a semi-presidential system, in a semi-presidential system which in which, uh, according to the Constitution, as is the case in Romania, the Parliament has the power to suspend the President, which is not impeached, suspend, for breaking the Constitution. Impeaching is something else, you know, for treason and so on. But this is sort of a part of this checks and balances and balance system that Romania has, which creates so many problems, that the, constitutional, the, the authors of the Constitution have given the Parliament an extraordinary power to suspend the President, you know to suspend, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, not to impeach, because again, impeachment is a trial, a case of treason, whatever, in big cases, that's true for any political system, basically. Suspending means that it's almost, a, uh, you know, the parliament has the power to remove the prime minister and cabinet. Normally, in, in a parliamentary system or a semi-presidential system, they can do that because the legitimacy of the prime minister and the cabinet comes from the parliament. But to have the power to suspend the president is, well, Rare, I would say. And, and they use it. And they use it for political purposes. Now, you understand how, how people would be disillusioned, disappointed, outraged by such behavior from the political elite, because the public doesn't like it when uh, politics, uh, when, when there are political acts that destabilize the country. Okay? And removing the president through such acts is a deeply destabilizing act. It's a deeply, you know, remember how, what, how traumatic uh, the attempted impeachment of Nixon, right? which never went to the end, he just resigned. But even today it's so traumatic, what, 35 years later, whatever it is, 30 years later, 40, 40 years later, even today it's so traumatic, right? Now, uh, but it's part of the, of the uh, learning the, the skills of, 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 of representative democracy, learning the skills of playing this game, that political actors need to grow and become mature enough to understand that, uh, that certain things are not done. Yeah? That, that compromise, even in uh, you know, very tough situations, is preferable to undermining the stability of the system. Yeah? But that's something you need to learn. Uh, to be given, give an example, you know, Al Gore in 2000, when, when he conceded the election, although he could have fought out that recount in Florida and whatever, up, up to, you know, whatever, until things have given. He, he preferred to give it up in order to maintain the stability of the system. Because such a wrench thrown into the engine, with all the passions that it have been, would have engendered in the society, would have been very destructive to the stability of the society and of the system. He preferred not to do that. So it's part of political maturity. I'm not sure these actors had that. And of course, it's combined with the fact that his personality is very abrasive and so on. But still. Okay, another interesting thing happens in this period, uh, late 2000s, is that um, the Hungarian, uh, the um, uh, Democratic Alliance of Hungarians in Romania, the name on the list here is Democratic Union, but actually the original name is Democratic Alliance, and it's more appropriate because it's an alliance of many, many groups which are conscious that they can only win together. However, it breaks apart because it, uh, the, of many tensions, Point is that since mid 2000s you have a more radical Hungarian party, mostly associated with the Seiklers, which were which are an ethnic group nowadays associated with the Hungarian, speaks Hungarian, but originally of, of a slightly different origin, but consider themselves part of the Hungarian nation, speak Hungarian, whatever. Uh, the point is that they there there is a, there are two factions, more moderates, a majority, and a more radical, more I would say nationalistic, and so on. And that also undermines the Democratic Alliance of Hungarians in Romania. Why is this important? Is because the, the, the guarantee of the role of uh, that uh, the Democratic Alliance of Hungarians in Romania has played in Romanian uh, politics is the fact that they always got a certain uh, percentage of votes and always got into the parliament. Now, with massive emigration from uh, that happens in the 2000s and late 90s, uh, which includes many ethnic Hungarians. Um, 
the, there is a danger, a real danger for the, for the Hungarian party not to make it into parliament. Look, 6.17%, there's a 5% threshold. It's very close, right? And uh, the, again, this would undo the entire project of self government, right? Of, of, of uh, solving the multi ethnic issue through representation, right? So it's an interesting situation. Uh, and it's been played out in many ways, but I just wanted to note that. Okay, 2008, you have, we have elections to the parliament. So note that uh, starting in 2004, the, pre the president's mandate is five years, the parliament is four. The change was done in around the year 2000 with the idea of strengthening the president. Well, it just complicated the situation. It's a good idea, right, to, re to, to, to undo this bad system in many ways, right? But in other ways, it's not a good idea because now it's almost a given that you will have cohabitation all the time, right? Because the president will have four, parliament four, uh, president will have five, the parliament four, so you will always have these these overlaps, uh, and which you will see uh, you will see that uh, play out in politics, right? President five, parliament four, and then another parliament, and then another president. I mean, you have all these spaces here in which different governments can form for a year, for three years, and so on. By the fact that, for example, here you have unified government, here you have cohabitation, here maybe, so one election influences the other, and maybe they're just one year apart, uh, it just complicates the situation. In any case, 2008, so what you see is, uh, <laughs> you see the division, the cleavage that I told you about, Basescu and his allies and the rest. Because the two major forces here now are this, um, uh, basically, uh, well, the three major forces now are the, the social democrats, the liberals, and the uh, democrats, who now call themselves the democratic liberals. Remember, this is the democratic party of Vesescu, plus parts of the liberal party, and they take up the name of democratic liberal. Why? Because the, Romanian parties are not ideologically, have not been ideologically very coherent, okay? Uh, most of them, okay? Uh, and uh, what happens uh, with Basescu, because I told you he's also pro-market, neoliberal economically and so on, uh, his democratic party used to be sort of a social democratic party, now becomes a right liberal, literally, you know, economically liberal, but also populist, also traditionalist, but economically very fiercely uh, you know, pro market reforms and uh, shock therapy and so on party, hence the name Democratic Liberals. While the Liberal Party, it, hilariously, will kind of be in the center right, more a little bit to the left, and so on. Social Democrats remain on the left, but again, with their baggage of oligarchs and so on. Notice that they, in the election results, you have both the major uh, uh, parties. Uh, the Social Democrats and Basescu's party get about 33%, so nobody can form the government. Uh, so basically they form a sort of a grand coalition of convenience. But this is 2008, so basically they form it for a year, because next year you would have presidential elections again, right? Where things can be become resettled. Yeah, that's again part of the, president, the, the system, the problem with the system. And so let's look at the... Um, what I wanted to, to, to show you here, I posted a, a, a geographical map uh, because um, uh, something uh, uh, changed here in terms of the um, well, uh, the representation in the parliament has changed. Uh, and what is shown here is why do I have the map of the world, right? Because uh, according to a new electoral law, uh, there are uh, seats reserved in the parliament to, for the members of the diaspora. Uh, and why are they there? Uh, why did they introduce this new sort of a district for the, for the Romanians living around, around the globe? And why not before? Because one of the phenomena of late 90s, early 2000s was a, uh, literally a massive emigration of Romanians, mostly in the EU countries. With entry into the EU, they could move wherever. And for example, today, the largest ethnic minority in Italy are the Romanians, with about a million people. Right? Why Italy? Because it's easy to learn, it's easy to speak the language, learn the language, because most languages are based on Latin and they're very similar. Actually, um, so in Spain, 
large, large matter in, in Portugal for the same reasons, linguistic uh, culture, the reasons there. So there are about, who knows, about 2 million Romanians now living abroad because they can do that because of the EU but also for because there has been this emigration and taking this into account uh, the new electoral law has introduced a, basically a district, a worldwide district for, for these Romanians. Actually there are three spots, uh, three districts, one for the global east, one for the global west and one for the global south so to speak in a way. Uh, but notice what I wanted to point out is how, how you know, we talked about the cleavages between East and West and how funny it is that they play out also at the worldwide level that the cleavage towards the Western, uh, you know, the Westward looking votes for the reformist PDL, right, Democratic Liberals the more Eastward uh, voting, uh, looking, uh, the East part of the world <laughs> votes for uh, uh, Social Democrats and for some strange reason uh, the uh, well, it's not strange, I'm going to explain this in a second. You know, Africa and Middle East votes for the Hungarian uh, 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 you know, uh, party. Well, they didn't really. Because as I mentioned that the electoral system has changed. So, how has it changed? Well, remember that Romania had a PR system uh, with a 5% uh, threshold for parties, more for coalition. Pretty straightforward with the problems that of lack of accountability. Now, they tried to move out of this and uh, increase accountability um, by making a changing the system so that uh, people elect individuals and not parties so but still maintain the proportionality because if you go to SMD FPP as the US UK have that's completely disproportional many people uh, many parties would not get represented and especially the minorities or the Hungarian minority for example would not get represented this winner take all is not representative it's not very democratic in many ways in the sense of you know, there is no proportion between how many people support an idea and how many people, how much that's represented uh, in the parliament. The phenomenon of wasted votes. Anyway, see the electoral systems in that action. Um, so they introduce something uh, which is even hard to categorize because you know maybe you can call it a mixed member proportion, but it's not the mixed member proportion that we know. The system that is in place is basically everybody votes for an individual in a district so you're going to say, oh that sounds familiar, right? The, whoever gets more than 50% in this district wins the seat, that never happens basically. If nobody gets 50% so to win the seat, then all the, the, the percentages of the votes given for each individual which represent different parties of course are collected at the level of the wider district and then at the level of the country and then it become, becomes this proportional system right, in which each party gets about the, the percentage that they have received uh, but not more than the districts that, that have been uh, assigned it is a very very complicated system and it's so proportionally bent that actually the number of representatives in the chamber of, of uh, deputies and, uh, um, uh, and in, the, in the senate is actually uh, fluctuates wildly. I mean, uh, I think it's the last election where the number increased with about a hundred just because they had to add more to be exactly proportional. It's a very complex system which few people actually understand and people don't know what the results of the vote are until this mechanism is played out, right? And, and also because it's based on redistribution of votes. Here you have Africa voting for the Hungarian minority. Actually, that's not what happened because all of this is one basically district this was won by uh, the center right, center left, and because there were remains, uh, the, there were percentage of the vote that remained, right, that weren't distributed from these other votes, uh, they had to be given to the Hungarian party to maintain proportionality, and so they got this seat here. As you see, it's it's complex. So you can, you know. Uh, you don't know exactly who's going to win. <laughs> you, you vote for a person for a, representing your party, but then you don't, unless that person gets fifty percent of the vote in the district, which doesn't happen, it gets redistributed, and then you wait to see who's going to get actually that seat. So it's a very dissatisfying system. But the idea was to combine direct accountability with proportionality. Well, I, I would argue there would have been better solutions here. Uh, and indeed, after this uh, electoral system was introduced, 
uh, there have been attempts, I think it was 2006 or so, uh, there have been attempts to introduce other electoral systems. So on the central left, on the anti bassesco system or the central left, they have tried to introduce SMD, Social Democrats, SMD, FDP, which would have been convenient for them because that would have eliminated their rivals uh, in many places, but also inconvenient for many other parties. So it was a politically motivated uh, decision, I guess it's the UK-US system. But it's, it's again, it's, not, it's very unpopular because it's not representative. Um, it failed. Then, um, there would have the, the, the Basescu, uh, people around Basescu and Basescu tried an SMD2 ballot, like in France, again the French model. And remember this is, just like in the presidential election, each district, everybody runs, and then in the second round, it's only the first two. Whoever gets voted here will, represent, will be an individual that uh, represents the district and he will have the majority. It kind of pushes towards proportionality, but Accenture is the largest party, so it works against fragmentation. Uh, it's more representative, but again, this also failed. So right now we're stuck with that previous electoral system, which doesn't make anyone happy. Especially since in 2007, um, uh, the uh, or uh, thereabouts, um, the president, I'm trying to see exactly when, when this was, uh, the Basesco and, and the forces supporting him uh, introduced, uh, there it is, in 2009, um, the Basesco and the forces supporting him uh, introduced uh, uh, a referendum uh, uh, well, brought an issue to a referendum, meaning to a vote by the population, by which they wanted to change, to reform the parliament. Remember the fifth cleavage that I mentioned, between the people and the political elite itself, right? And this was directed against, to, you know, playing into this frustration again, to reform the political system itself. So to reform the parliament, how? People are dissatisfied with the elite because they consider them just, you know, people who want to stay in power in order to get benefits. Well, let's limit the size, let's, let's, let's lower the size of the parliament, let's transform it from a bicameral to a unicameral, and indeed, why is it bicameral, we don't know it at all. Right, it's this idea of balance, but it's just a large beast. Um, but unicameral and small. And the referendum that was introduced passed overwhelmingly. 77% or 80% of the population, basically, voted both to reduce the size of the parliament to 300 maximum, which I think is a decent side, in my opinion. Uh, and in fact, uh, the first question, which was unicameral, you had 77% yes. The second question, which said reducing the size, has 88% yes. So less politicians, fewer politicians. It gives you a sense of this idea of, of uh, you know, these politicians, but well, they're just bigger and whatever. Even in established democracies, this is a, this is a feeling that is present. So, um, so that happens in 2009. The referendum passed, and normally, a referendum should be, you know, implemented into law, right? It never happened because the political elite literally opposed the implementation of the results of this referendum. So you get, then you get a sense of how happy the people are about not being taken into into consideration. Uh, and what is the solution? Well, vote other people. Which other people? Yeah, because. We're talking about basically the largest proportion of this political class. And on the other side was Basescu, who basically kept, who kept alienating everybody else, and gradually also parts of the population because of pushing for economic reforms and so on, and shock therapy. So he was both reformist in terms of, you know, lower the size of the parliament, but also reformist economically. A large part of the population suffered from those economic reforms. Uh, uh, around 2009, but wanted the, the political class reform, so even his support dwindled and, and was divided for all these aspects. Okay, so uh, 2008, uh, uh, 2009, we didn't talk about this, but you can guess that Basescu uh, wins the presidency very narrowly, very narrowly, and again, uh, point what, point three percent, and mostly, and here's the interesting thing, mostly through the support, I mean, that point three percent of some, some percentages that really mattered happened through the vote of the diaspora, of the million of either, you know, workers who go and, and live and work in other countries or young professionals uh, who left the country to build a better life, 
But I still, you know, love the country, but still consider myself Romanian, and part of that, they, they're there just to, 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 to develop professionally and so on. And who voted, and, and really, who, who voted for Basescu because of his anti corruption, anti communist, uh, reformist, neoliberal profile. Okay? And not being in the country, not seeing the dark side of the profile, which is his abrasive, kind of gregarious, kind of populist side, and so on. So that's pushed him over. So the, which had the consequence that in the next presidential elections uh, there will be attempts from the social democrats to manipulate the diaspora vote, and we'll talk about that, with dire consequences. Okay, 2012 parliament, uh, here you have a wonderful, wonderful anti, is, is the division, is the cleavage, Basescu and the rest, in action. Everybody else versus Bosesco. I mean, that's basically what it is. The, the alliance is called the Social Liberal Union. It means, which means absolutely nothing. Because it's either social democratic or it's liberal. I mean, that doesn't work together. It's actually the anti bosesco coalition. Uh, USL, and you see, it has all kinds of uh, parties, right, left, whatever. Then you have the right Romania alliance, which tells you that at this point, the PDL, the Bosescu's party, has really embraced the center-right, uh, sort of populism, mostly neoliberal, economically uh, conservative in that sense, uh, um, you know, profile. There it is. Yeah. Uh, and they're crushed, though. They're crushed by the, <laughs> the anti Basescu uh, coalition. So, what results from this? Well, Basescu doesn't go away. This is the election. These are the elections for the parliament. He still has two years to go as president. So, you have again a coalition government. Because uh, no, a cohabitation situation, sorry. A cohabitation situation where the prime minister is from one party and the president from another. Well, this prime minister needs to be mentioned. This is Ponta. He's the, from the Social Democrats. He's already been uh, 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 a prime minister. He's been around. I haven't mentioned him, but anyway, it's important to mention. This is sort of a, one of the young, young and often coming oligarchs from the, from the Social Democrats who rise in the second half of the 2000s. Uh, and who survives uh, a large number of, of, uh, of, uh, of problems. Uh, he is discovered uh, to, for example, uh, he is discovered to have plagiarized his uh, PhD. Yes, this seems to be a disease. Uh, plagiarized his PhD, uh, lied about his MA, uh, and such. Uh, so, Normally, right, you, we just talked about the president of Hungary who resigned because of this, actually the foreign minister of Germany resigned because of this. Uh, around the same time, it's, it's, there was this wave. Uh, so, be careful with your academic work. Uh, be very careful. Uh, so, <coughs> you, you have this scandal uh, affecting him, and many other scandals. You know, he's, he's, a, he's, a, he's the disciple of... Adriano Stase, who was that prime minister who ran for the presidency from the Social Democrats at the beginning of the 2000s, that aggressive, arrogant, authoritarian minded prime minister. Well, he's on that model, just younger. Um, and so <laughs> he's discovered to have plagiarized. You would expect him to resign. He would not resign. In fact, uh, the, the Ethics Council, the, the level of the National Education Ministry, that that was in place is overnight changed by the government that he was leading. So he basically changes the Ethics Council, appoints other people who find him miraculously not guilty of having copied pages and pages from his PhD. And there are many other uh, scandals. Well, speaking of scandals, the period since 2004, and especially 2005, you know, 2006 and so on, I mentioned the other cleavage, which is corruption versus anti-corruption. And it is worth mentioning because several very important institutions are built up there. Uh, mostly through the efforts of uh, Vesescu and the parties supporting him. Again, he falls on that side of the, of the cleavage. Uh, uh, and one of the key institutions here, uh, which includes the appointment of a minister of justice from the civil society, who was bent on cleaning corruption. And remember, you know, uh, basically before 2006, justice was not the judicial system was not independent because of the political influence that it had, mostly through the legacy of the social democrats ruling. Um, but there's this minister of justice that comes in as a reform. Unfortunately, any such reforms, 
you know, uh, having a position in a government depends on maintaining a coalition government. Notice how often these coalitions change because of these cleavages, because of Basescu and anti Basescu. So that woman, that lady does not remain long in, in position. However, another institution is established, which is the National Anti-Corruption Department or Direction, which is independent. Which is independent, uh, and you have a description of the judicial system uh, there on the canvas, uh, which is independent and which has appointed uh, a very uh, uh, determined uh, young woman uh, at its head uh, in uh, around 2006 or thereabouts, who since has become the most, one of the most trusted and liked, popularly liked institutions in Romania, because it has become extremely active, gradually, surely, but extremely active. And one of the biggest coups was in 2012, when they actually arrested, managed after many trials which he survived, they actually prosecuted and arrested the former Prime Minister Adrian Stas and goes into jail. That was a huge public shock because people were had this image of, okay, politicians are corrupt, especially those from the uh, social democrats, but others as well. But they will never get to jail, even if they are trials, because they have always, you know, they get sick and this and that and the other thing. Just, justice is nothing to bad. And suddenly you have a former Prime Minister being thrown into, not just tried, because many have been tried, but thrown into jail. And there have been waves and waves of very public figures, former footballers, former uh, very prominent media owners, prominent businessmen who got, actually were sentenced to jail. This growth in the independence of justice is to a large degree, well, to a good degree attributable to the impetus given by this president, Vasescu, when he was president, to the tools that he had to appoint people uh, and to push in a certain direction very often pushing beyond his boundaries, but remember, between 1996 and 2000, when there was a chance for the anti-communist opposition to do such reforms, the president had all the wonderful in intentions, but he was too constitutionally minded, so to speak, and he never wanted to bypass his, he never became an aggressive president. Well, people want presidents to do stuff. But Sescu did stuff. However, <laughs> the downside was that he was also this temperament, this overbearing, whatever, aggressive, uh, you know, whatever. Gregorius, you know, sort of vulgar uh, temperament, and yet he did stuff. So both sides happened. Anyway, this literally uh, in the last year, only in the last year, over 1,100, 1,100 uh, public figures, elected re representatives, and people employed in the state have been arrested through these anti-corruption. Only last year. Okay, that is a huge sweep, and people compare it with the money politic. Uh, 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 operation in Italy in the early 90s, which, which was a big, uh, uh, you know, earthquake in Italian politics, to which Romanian politics resemble. Um, you know, not by chance the cultural resemblance. Uh, and um, people compare, compare it with that favorably, saying this is much greater. And it truly is. And one of the latest developments, literally in the last two months, last month maybe, last weeks, uh, has been that the former president, Ion Iliescu, has been indicted for that minor's intervention of 1990. But, uh, and, uh, and he was indicted by not this anti-corruption unit, but by other procurators, uh, prosecutors from uh, the military and uh, civil prosecutors for crimes against humanity for the, his role in that minor's intervention where people died. And that would have been unbelievable, incredible, just a few years ago. It shows you that the judiciary, which is a key aspect of a functioning democracy, the rule of law has started to grow uh, a sense of the self, to grow a sense of independence, uh, which needed an impulse initially, but now they're kind of going. Now, how strong is this? How? It always depends on politics. It's false to think that judiciary is just independent. It always depends on politics. Without a politics that allows it to be independent, it will not be independent. That applies in any country in the world, including the United States. Okay? Uh, the judiciary is a sort of a secondary uh, branch in that sense because its survival is, you know, the other branches need to allow it to, 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 to or at least acknowledge that it has the right to, to, to be independent. Otherwise, it will not survive. So we'll see the future, but it has been, uh, it has been uh, literally now, uh, they, many of these, you know, uh, public employees live in fear because they're even afraid that uh, 
to, to, to even grant contracts and whatever, not, not knowing what, you know, knowing that they, they can get to jail, actually get to jail, which until now has been just a, until a few years ago has been just a, uh, so you see, corruption, anti-corruption, uh, one of the recent polls uh, showed that uh, uh, after the army, the Orthodox Church, and um, I don't know what was the other uh, institution, the National Anti-Corruption Direction is the most popular, most trusted institution in Romania. Okay, uh, 2012 elections are dominated then by these two blocks. Uh, the anti Pasescu bloc wins, Ponta is prime minister. This Ponta, who again, an oligarch involved in all kinds of shady deals, uh, <laughs> demonstrated plagiarist. Oh, by the way, just a few months ago, he actually renounced his PhD, kind of asked the university to withdraw it. Um, and then you have the 2014 election for president. Well, by this time, remember, uh, so 2014 is the end of the second mandate of Bessescu. Bessescu is not going to run. So this division between Bessescu and uh, anti Bessescu falls apart. And the natural sort of a ideological breakdown, uh, the ideological you know, division of parties re establishes itself. So you have the center left, uh, the social democrats, who propose Ponta for president. Yeah? vigorously, um, and you have uh, uh, liberals basically, now with Basescu gone, the democratic liberals and the liberals find themselves in the same center-right position again, and they propose this person, of this, this, this very interesting figure of Klaus Johannes, who is an ethnic German from Romania, who used to be the mayor of the, one of the historical ethnic German towns in, in Transylvania. Uh, few, there are very few Germans, I mean, relatively just uh, uh, some tens of thousands of Germans left out of hundreds of thousands or even more than a million because of that massive immigration after 1990, which uh, a large a great tragedy of uh, Romanian society after 1990. He is one of those who stayed, and I posted an article about him, which is very interesting. He was the mayor of this city in the heart of Transylvania, a very successful mayor, very respected. And the Germans, the ethnic Germans, have this, uh, this image, cultural image in Romania of being workers, disciplined, ordered, well, you, you know the image, right? Um, and guess what? He is elected president. He is elected president, which is tremendous. An ethnic German in a nation state, right? In a nation state, right? He is elected president on this sort of a civilized sort of an idea that we need someone who is civilized, pro-European and so on. But perhaps it also leads us back to what we uh, talked about, studied in the 19th century Romania, that the first monarch and the monarch decline of Romania was actually a German prince, right? which they invited to, to, uh, to, take, uh, to take a throne. It was very successful. Uh, okay, so um, he wins, but how he wins is also uh, tremendously interesting. Um, he wins, the first round, you see, he's almost, he's almost clearly defeated by, by Ponta, so 10%. Okay, 10% in the first time doesn't look like he's going to get more than 50%. I mean, how can you get 20% more, almost double your, your, your votes up to the uh, second round? And yet he will do that. And that will be, so he will almost double his votes uh, between the two rounds. Now, this is a quiet, this is the antithesis of Bassesco. He's, a, he's very civilized and quieter and not as aggressive, and I'm not sure he's going to work out as a president, actually, in a semi-presidential system where you need an active uh, president. We don't know. Uh, but he is, he manages to almost double it, and uh, let's see if I have that data here. In the, indeed, notice this phenomenal distinction, uh, difference between the turnout in the first round and the turnout in the second round. The first round, 53%. It's so a normal after your know, transition type turnout in elections. 64, 10% more in the second round of the presidential election. That's, that's very rare. Usually it's fewer people who show up in the second round, right? What happened? What happened is in the first round, as I said, the Social Democrats uh, who had at this point the government, right? Remember, Ponta is PM, president is Moses. Huge fights between them, really nasty. Another attempt to suspend the president happened meanwhile. Uh, referendum, uh, you know, it was, uh, you know, very turbulent, very turbulent uh, uh, time. Uh, <coughs> so they, the social democrats have the government, government controls the foreign affairs, including 
diplomatic representation and embassies, and that's where the diaspora votes. Well, just before the election, they have closed many electoral uh, 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 sort of uh, voting points in the diaspora, in the idea of limiting the access to of vote to the diaspora, obviously, because previously, remember, Vesescu was won the second round because of the diaspora. And, and people were hugely outraged, but they were even more outraged when on the day of the vote, you saw on TV, and this is just last year, you saw on TV uh, hundreds and hundreds and perhaps thousands of people from all over the globe, uh, Romanians, standing in line for 8 to 10 to 12 hours or whatever, hours and hours, in the cold, usually it's in November, uh, November to December, um, in the cold, in, oh, and everywhere there is huge lines because everywhere it went tremendously diff slow and it was tremendously difficult and there were too many people for the small amount of booths and so on so there was this complete PR disaster which the image that was transmitted by all the TV stations uh, some of which however are you know owned by people associated with the oligarchs which is also important to note that you know just because you have private media doesn't mean it's free media uh, they're very very partisan um, uh, and um, so <laughs> What people in Romania saw were, were, were citizens, Romanian citizens, who tried to exercise their citizenship right, one of the most basic citizenship rights of voting, and were not allowed. And that created such a tremendous outrage that everybody in Romania mobilized, mostly, literally, just, this was the public, the, the civil society, mostly through Facebook and whatever, Twitter, whatever they use. And it was a, 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 a groundswell of protest, and they showed up in the second round, and they crushed <laughs> Victor Ponta for the presidency. All of these wonderful situations of democracy uh, in action. Okay, but you know, elections happen, it's a certain presidential system, so now you have Johannes, Klaus Johannes for uh, uh, president, still cohabitation because PM Ponta does not resign, and he is still the Social Democrats are in power. Are in power until recently. Meanwhile, this year, you know, tremendous things. Uh, in June, uh, or thereabouts, uh, that same anti-corruption division prosecutes and indicts the sitting Prime Minister Ponta for shady deals from, you know, 10 years ago and so on. He is actually indicted, and yet he remains in function, he would not resign. I mean, you can, again, imagine the public's sentiment about the political class, right? But the more latest development, literally a, a, few, months, a few weeks ago, um, Ponta resigned. And the, way, the reason why he resigned is that there have been public manifestations. Public manifestations, protests of 20,000 people just in Bucharest, not because of politics. And this is another thing that I mean, remember, remember that cleavage I mentioned between the political class and the people. This cleavage has been manifested, as your book makes it, uh, points out, for non political issues. For example, there, there are these huge environmental concerns, for example, about Roshia Montana, which is uh, a gold exploitation that people feel that the government is handing out these contracts for shady, for benefits, for shady deals, for bribes, but the, but the ones who will suffer will be the people because it will have huge environmental impact and destroy uh, all the settlements and, and it just feels that you know, you're taking our common good for your benefit. And, so there would have been, in the previous years, huge grassroots manifestations basically against the political class. Basically against the political class in defense of a common ground issue. And that's what happened a few weeks ago. Uh, the greatest, uh, the most tragic and destructive uh, fire in Romanian history took place at a concert, at a rock, co rock concert uh, a few weeks ago, uh, where about 30 people more than 30 people died at this rock concert, and uh, hundreds were injured uh, in this in this huge fire, and it really shook the entire Romanian society to the ground. And you're going to say, okay, but why protest if there was a fire? It was a fire, but the the clearly the the, the, the venue was not ready to have a concert and fire pyrotechnical uh, you know events and then uh, sparkles and whatever such you know fire show whatever it, it had. It was not appropriate for that. And that took immediately, people thought, why was this allowed? Again, corruption. 
So basically the Gramsci was against corruption and incompetence because that led to the death of all these young people, people with children, you know, I mean, you know, families, you know, who were at a concert and who died, burned alive and so on. And this huge outrage in every single city. But again, remember, it's a cause, but it's sort of an outlet of a greater dissatisfaction with corruption, with incompetence, with government, with the political class not doing its job. It was so huge that Ponta finally resigned, who was embattled in so many fronts. So the latest developments in this adventure of Romanian politics is that now you have a technocratic government, 